a lot of times I'll, I will watch a movie 8, 10, 20 times. And there, there's a process that works when you watch a movie that many times where you say certain things will work every time you watch a movie. In the same way that you can watch a comedy and you can laugh every single time a certain things comes up. And other times you, you start seeing the nuts and bolts and say, well, this is always working. And here they're just connecting stuff. And you start saying, ah, I get it. I see what they're doing. I see how they're, t they're taking this piece that works and this other piece that works. And they couldn't quite, they kind of, they found some connective tissue to, to stick it together. I see exactly what they're doing. That was screenwriter and author Neil Marshall Stevens talking about one of the ideas found in his great new book on the process of creating horror on screen, A Sense of Dread. Hello, and welcome to episode 117 of the Occasional Film Podcast, the occasional companion podcast to the Fast Cheap Movie Thoughts blog. I'm the blog's editor, John Gaspard. In today's episode, we chat with Neil Stevens about his book, and we're joined by my occasional co-host, vampire expert and horror aficionado, Brian Forrest. We'll talk about what scares us on screen, with Neil providing some great examples from some classic horror films. And he should know. Neil has an impressive IMDb resume, having written scores of horror films over a long and impressive screenwriting career. Neil, you have a really long and storied history in the horror cinema. Can you remember the very first horror movie that, that had an impact on you? Well, actually, looking back, the first movie that scared the hell out of me wasn't a horror movie. Huh. It was actually a Disney movie called Johnny Tremaine. It, it was it was a, a kid's movie, and there was a scene in that movie. Johnny Tremaine was a, a kid during the Revolutionary War, who knew Paul Revere, who, as you may remember, was a silversmith. And there's a scene in that movie, the British are coming, and Paul Revere has got this urn of molten silver. It gets knocked onto a table. John Tremaine trips and puts his hand face up into the molten silver and fries his hand. And I'm sure, I know, I every kid in the audience goes like... <gasps> That's actually not the scariest part of the movie. Later on, surgeons are unwrapping his burnt hand and they look down and they react in horror. His fingers have healed together, stuck together. We don't see it and they say, oh, we're going to have to cut his fingers apart, which also happens off screen. Off screen and again, in our imagination, imagining no anesthesia back then. It's a revolutionary war. So poor Johnny Tremaine has to have his, his heel together fingers cut apart. The memory of what that must be like has lasted in what he, I, I could have only oh, must have been like five or six when I saw it. My parents dragged me to see Johnny Tremaine. It's a happy Disney movie. I'm 67 years old. So it's been over a half a century since I saw this movie and was appropriately traumatized by those images. So Disney knew how to scare little kids, that's for sure. He sure did. Wow. That's a horrible story. Yeah. So as for uh, official horror movies that scared the hell out of me, uh, again, we used to watch Fantasmic Features on the TV in Boston. I remember a, a movie called Teenagers from Outer Space. They weren't actually teenagers. They were all in their 30s. But anyway, these invaders had a skeleton ray. That as they would aim it at someone, it would flash, and you were instantly reduced literally to a skeleton. And they were, they didn't care who, the, so as, as soon as they come out of their spaceship, there's a barking dog and the dog falls down reduced to bones they didn't care they would use a, a woman's climbing out of a swimming pool 
skeleton floating in the pool. The casualness with which completely innocent people are reduced to skeletons, again, just absolutely horrified me. Couldn't have been much older than nine or 10 when I watched this movie. But the fact that human flesh is reduced to skeletons, but also the casual innocence of which people are reduced to you know, flesh is stripped off their bones is terrifying to me. I, I, I wonder how you parlayed that early sense of, oh, I like horror movies into I want to create horror as a genre? Well, I, I was one of a, a whole generation of kids who got Super 8 cameras and made, you know, well, made stop motion movies and, and made monster movies in their basements. Pursuant to that, I, I would I was writing scripts when I was 13 years old. I guess people people now do it with phones. We didn't we didn't have we didn't have cell phones back when I was a kid, but we had we had super eight cameras and then you know little cartridge things that we'd slug and slug in. And so I, I made tons of, of those those little stop motion movies down in my basement. You still have some of them? I guess I may have them somewhere. I may have I may have I think I have an old creaky super eight projector you, somewhere. The I don't think you can get a bulb for it anymore. They're, they're so you know I've got one up there on my uh wonder if it would work. I yeah, uh, that's that's the big question. I wonder if it would work. Heaven only knows. But that's a great way to learn visual storytelling. Yeah. yeah. When I, I ultimately I went to NYU grad film and, and all the films that we shot to first first year was all silent. For a silent film, then silent with sound effects, but you weren't allowed to use sync sync sound until you got to second year if you made it that far. Did you make it that far? Uh, yes, I did. I actually graduated back at NYU. It was a very rough program at, at the time. They cut the student enrollment in half going from first to second year. So mm -hmm. it was it was a rough program back then. That's brutal. Yeah. So you leave film school with something under your arm that you've mm -hmm. shot. Where does that lead you? It certainly didn't didn't get me much in the way of employment at the time. I ended up going right back to NYU. I ran their equipment room of all things for something like six years. But during all those six years, I was I was writing the they had a they had like a computer that they used to turn out the schedules. And then when they weren't turning schedules, I was using that computer to write my screenplays using WordStar. If anyone remembers that that old program god it was horrible but oh, yeah. it, it was it was free because they had in the equipment room and uh eventually i sent some stuff to laurel entertainment which is the company that did tales from the dark side and they had an open submission program you, if you signed a release form you could send them stuff and I, i'd gone in and i'd met tom allen who was there their senior story editor i had a screenplay i went in and talked about it he liked it it wasn't for them, but then he invited me to submit ideas for their new series, their follow-up series to Tales from the Dark Side, which is a thing called Monsters. And I went in and I pitched some ideas, and they bought one, and it was it turned out to be the premiere episode of of Monsters. And shortly after that, tragically, Tom Allen passed away, and the the VP Mitch Galen invited me in and said, "Would you like to take over?" and be our senior story editor on Monsters and our other projects. And meanwhile, you know, for the second part of that whole series, I was still working in the equipment room at NYU and also working as a senior story editor on Monsters and being their creative consultant and doing, you know, reading hundreds of scripts for, for Laurel Entertainment. And then eventually I, I quit the equipment room and I went and I worked for them full time and wrote a bunch of episodes for Monsters and... I was I was a uh, story editor on The Stand and The Langoliers, which wasn't so good, but on a bunch of other projects, it was just an enormous learning experience. And The Stand, I think, turned out really well. Mm -hmm. Other stuff, The Langoliers did not work out really well, and, and a bunch of other projects that were not horror. But... Why do you think some things, uh, especially, let's talk about Stephen King, why do you think some of those things adapted well and some didn't? Um, well, Langoliers was not, was, was a just a, it wasn't that great wasn't that strong a project and i think the idea the, trying to make that and stretch that out into a mini series wasn't that strong it wasn't that strong the material wasn't really there i think there are times when staying faithful to the material is the right approach it certainly was the right approach with the stand working with the langoliers you know there were certainly elements of the langoliers that were strong 
and other stuff that was really just so-so. And I think if you'd had the willingness to step aside and do something different with it, it would probably have ended up, especially because they were expanding it into a miniseries. Being just devoted to the original material, I think, ended up with a product that was really thin. Plus, we had hired a special effects company that the Langoliers themselves were just horrible. It was, it was really substandard, honestly. So it did not work out very well. I'm guessing with all these different projects you had to work on, you probably had to start dealing with types of horror and genres of horror that weren't in your comfort zone, maybe not even what you wanted to do. Uh, what kind of learning curve was that for you? You end up having to deal with a lot of different kinds of horror, especially with you know working in monsters where you, I, I just uh, you just were turning stuff out tremendously fast. But also, I grew up at a certain kind of horror. I was never a huge fan of slasher stuff. I missed that whole era of horror. Certain kinds of movies appealed to me. That particular kind of transgressive material never really clicked. Why do you think that is with you? Because the, the, this this simple act of repetitive bloodletting, for me, it always it always felt thin. I mean, it's it's not that I objected to explicit violence or explicit gore. I mean, I think that Dawn of the Dead unquestionably is one of the most brilliant horror movies ever made. And there's certainly George Romero didn't pull back from explicit violence or a movie like Hellraiser, the same deal. It's a question of how the filmmaker employs the use of graphic violence to elevate the material. What I've told people when you watch a movie like Dawn of the Dead, the first 10 or 15 minutes of, of that movie, which by the way, I saw when it virtually when it first came out, saw it in the theater, you had never seen anything like that opening scene in terms of, of graphic violence with the arm being bitten and the <laughs> heads being blown off and all the rest. You were just like put through the ringer watching that opening. And after that opening, the movie was never that violent again. You never showed anything like that again. And you didn't have to because you, having seen those, those that opening scene, you were, you were so blown out of your seats. You said, I'm watching a movie where anything could happen to anyone. And that was a kind of really intelligent and that kind of thoughtful use of violence. It's what George Romero was always able to do. It was understanding how graphic images can affect the psychology of the viewer. Do you think it's also that with Romero's films, they're actually about something? Whereas a slasher film is really just about a body count. But with Romero, he always had another thing going. Well, of course. I mean, no movie that isn't about anything is ever going to really from my perspective, be worth watching. But I mean, even, even a movie like Hostel, which is, is exceptionally violent and harrowing, is certainly about something. And I think Eli Roth's movies, which get a really bad rap, are very much about something. He's got something to say with his depictions of violence and, and his images, not necessarily to my taste, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't say that he he's not he's making movies that are certainly about something he's not a dumb filmmaker by any stretch of the imagination so you work on monsters and then what happens i uh, worked on monsters i worked there for around six years and then they were acquired by a big studio and they were shut down and so i was uh, i was out of work uh, i had uh, I, i'd known uh woman named De Debbie Dion from Full Moon. I figured, well, I'll give that a shot. I'll call her up and see maybe I could write for a Full Moon. And so I gave her a shot. I, you know, reintroduced myself and said, you know, I'm looking to see if I could get some, you know, job maybe writing features for Full Moon Entertainment, Charlie Band's company. And they said, well, we uh, we pay around three thousand dollars for a feature. And I said, well, I, I got paid more than that for writing an episode of Monsters. That doesn't seem like such a good deal. And then my unemployment insurance ran out. Suddenly, it's a very good deal. It sounds, sounds like suddenly a very good deal. But I, you know, I made it very clear that money buys one draft. 
And if you want to rewrite, you got to pay me again. Because I, I knew what development was like, where they just expect draft after draft after draft. For, and I'd say, I can't do that. That doesn't make any sense. And I'd also, having worked for Monsters, I had learned to write really fast. And I could I could write a pass on a Monsters episode in two days. So I knew that I could write fast because these were 80-page scripts. And so I started writing for Full Moon. And over the course of like the next few years, I wrote something like... 50 or 60 features for charlie band oh. and uh, like a lot of them got made because they they don't they're not wasting money on movies that don't get made tons of them got made and in the midst of doing that i was you know whenever i got a break writing a full moon movie i would write spec scripts you know in the hopes i could sell something of my own that wasn't for three thousand dollars i didn't have an agent at that point i didn't have a manager at that point and so i i I'm not really good making cold calls to people. It's not my thing. I just like to sit and write my scripts. And I'd come home one day and I saw my wife was on the phone having this long conversation with someone. When she was done, I said, well, who was that? I said, oh, yeah, I called up to order something. So she's really good at getting on the phone and talking to people and calling them. And so I, I convinced her to be my manager. So she... She agreed. She changed, you know, she went out under her maiden name. She managed to get an option on a science fiction script that I'd written that, I mean, it was ultimately bought. It was never made. And then I decided, you know what? Horror is really my bread and butter writing for Charlie Band, but I don't really have a horror spec. And most of what was out those days in horror didn't really scare me that much. I should really write a script that, that would scare me. So I wrote a script called Deader, which I thought had all the stuff in it that I thought was really scary. And Judy went out uh, with that script, sent it to a bunch of people, sent it to some folks at Stan Winston's company. Uh, this is, they had a development deal. The um, producer that she talked to really liked it, asked if he could sort of slip it to some people. He did. He sent it to someone at a producer at Dimension. It's based in New York. And he really liked it. And they showed it to... Um, Bob Weinstein. Bob Weinstein called us on Sunday. He says, like, I'm I my halfway talk to talk to Judy, because they didn't know that Judy was my wife. So this is the best goddamn script I've read. I'm like three quarters of the way. Come in on Monday and we'll talk about it. So we came in on Monday and they bought the script. And of course, at that point it, it sort of went all over town and like this for like I for like a very short period of time it was like the flavor of the month and everyone loved me and we got myself I got myself an agent, I got myself like three pictures and this was a really big big to do. You know, from from that I also got thirteen ghosts and you know, la di da di da. So it was really it was really, you know, I was had, had like a really big opinion of myself after after that sale. Has that been tempered since then? Um, I, I kind of got the opinion that like, wow, this, you know, selling scripts is easy because, because people wanted to hire me because that script was super hot and was all over town. I learned subsequently there are flavors in writers and I was like that flavor of the month that fades. And then, and then kind of, you have to really do a lot more work to get things sold that was a hard lesson to learn mm -hmm. um but you know, i've i've managed to to keep working over over the years so that was uh i've i've written many scripts sold some and uh it's been, been a decent career i was just wondering you were having all the success writing screenplays when did you decide to make a jump into writing a book over the last five or six years i've been teaching uh, i taught uh, a, a woman that i knew from nyu actually uh, dorothy rumpolsky had uh, been instrumental in starting a screen a screenwriting program at uh, David Lynch uh, Institute for Cinematic Studies, and she realized at, at one point that she had a number of students who wanted to work in in horror. She remembered me back from NYU many years ago, so she got in touch with me and at, was, wanted to know if I was interested in mentoring those students. And I said absolutely. I'd done some other online teaching at, at other places, and so in the way it works is you kind of fly out for a, like an opening few days where you meet the students, and then you you fly back to where you come from. They go back to where they come from, and it's all done remotely. It's all the mentoring, and so I, I've been doing that now for five or six years. And during that kind of get together, you meet a bunch of guest lecturers and other teachers, other mentors. And a number of those people had written books for Michael Weesey Productions. And in the course of chatting, 
they suggested, well, you you know, you, you have a kind of encyclopedic knowledge of horror and horror cinema. That might be a good book for uh, for Michael Weesey. Give them a call and and see if you can come up with a pitch and an interesting take on it. And so I did, and I called them, and, and they responded. And so we were off to the races. The, the book is really, maybe delightful is the wrong word, but it's a captivating book because as you read through it and you you have outlined breaking down our different types of fears, uh, you can immediately in your mind go, oh, that's what that movie was doing. Oh, that was that. That's what was happening there. What was your research process like? I think that the research kind of developed over the decades as, as I studied what made movies scary and what was working not only in the movies that I was watching, but in the movies that I was writing. I mean, in the same way that when you work as a screenwriter, it, it becomes almost second nature to try to figure out what was working and what wasn't. Talking to fellow filmmakers and screenwriters, you have to say, like, how many times do you watch a movie? And a lot of times I'll, I will watch a movie eight, 10, 20 times. And there, there's a process that works when you watch a movie that many times where you say certain things will work every time you watch a movie in the same way that you can watch a comedy and you can laugh every single time a certain things comes up. And other times you, you start seeing the nuts and bolts and say, well, this is always working. And here they're just connecting stuff. And you start saying, ah, I get it. I see what they're doing. I see how they're, t they're taking this piece that works and this other piece that works. And they couldn't quite, they kind of, they found some connective tissue to, to stick it together. I see exactly what they're doing. And you start understanding whether you're watching a comedy or you're watching a drama or you're watching a scary movie. They knew exactly how to make this thing scary. And so this is how they're doing it. And they understood exactly how to make this thing scary. And it's like, ah, this is what they're using. Whether it is spider crawling on someone, that's always going to work. Or, oh, I see, this is just a jump scare. And the jump scare is, I understand, that's just... Because a big bang, a loud noise, a hand reaching in from, that's just, that's always going to work. It's going to work no matter what. It's just, it's just a kind of placeholder scare because they couldn't think of anything better. And there are movies that just, you know, where they're, it's just jump scares. And you can always use a jump scare because it's just, it's, I can, you, you can sneak up on a cat and jab and it'll jump. It's an instinctive response. And if a movie is just relying on jump scares, you know, it's because they don't have anything better. They haven't got any deeper than just having the phone ring and they turn up the soundtrack and, and, and you know, yeah, I can, you can always, you can always get an audience to jump by putting a loud sound on the soundtrack. Is there an example you can think of though, where there is a jump scare that you think is a genuinely good, effective jump scare? I can think of a movie that has two really excellent jump scares. John Carpenter's The Thing. When the doctor's giving the electric shock to the guy's chest and the chest opens and slams shut on his hand, didn't expect that's a super great jump scare. It is perfectly integrated into that scene. Everyone jumps, but it's also a brilliant continuation of that scene. Second jump scare, when McCready is testing everyone's blood and saying, we're going to do you next, puts the needle in, and that thing jumps out of, the, out of the Petri dish. Fantastic jump scare. We didn't see it coming. Everyone jumps. And it's, again, it's perfectly integrated into that scene. So two brilliant jump scares in what's already an incredibly brilliant movie. I remember watching the, uh, the, the commentary on Jaws. Yeah. And Spielberg said he got greedy with his jump scares. He had the moment towards the end of the film, you remember that Jaws comes out of the water while uh, it's being chummed. And he said he got this great reaction for the audience and he wanted one more. And he went back and he added in the scene earlier where the uh, corpse face comes through the hole. Yeah. yeah. And he said he never got the audience to react as well to the shark after he added in that corpse face coming through the hole of the yeah. ship. Yeah. And I, I wonder, do you think there's a point of diminishing returns with jump scares in one movie? I think there absolutely is. I mean, and, and I, I say that I have no end of admiration for Jaws. I think it, 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 it may be one of the most brilliant 
movies ever and it certainly has has stood the test of time so we've each come armed with some movies here that I thought it would be fun to talk about them with you so that you could sort of delve into the different types of fear that are outlined in the book. And we'll just sort of checkerboard back and forth here. I'm going to start with one of my favorite sense of dread movies, and that's Don't Look Now with uh, Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie, directed by Nick Rogue, which I saw way too young. First R-rated movie I saw, and I remember... I knew that it was supposed to be really scary. And I went with my older brother and we were standing in line and the the seven o'clock show was letting out. And I said to my brother, well, it can't be that scary. They're not saying anything. (laughs) Not realizing that they had all been stunned into silence about the last uh, five minutes of that movie. So what are your thoughts on Don't Look Now and where does that fit? When I talk about the sense of dread, which is what my my book is about, it's the notion of those aspects of our lives that we think of as safe and secure and dependable and sacred being suddenly or unexpectedly penetrated by the unknown or the unnatural, the unexpected. And you have to say, well, what are the things that we depend on? We depend on our homes. We depend on our families. And so that relationship of parent and child, what violates that and the loss of a child, loss is already wrenching. And so this sense of parents having lost a child, but then this notion that, well, maybe not, maybe the child is still out there somewhere is so deeply disturbing. And so this weird quest this pursuit in them and meanwhile in the background you have this sense of a of a killer of killings going on this really disturbing notion of the woman's half decayed body being pulled out of the water is just as an image is and again the notion of human body being reduced to mere flesh is deeply disturbing and nakedness coupled with decay it's deeply disturbing. And all of this sort of happening in the background. We don't quite know how these pieces connect. The notion that the search for the child and the notion that there's a killer on the loose. We know because the nature of cinematic storytelling is telling us that somehow these things are going to connect because I mean, in the real world, there are countless thousands of things drifting around that don't necessarily hook up but we know that one thing is going to collide with another and so there's this growing sense of profound unease because we know somehow this child in this red riding hood cape is wandering around it's like is this the child is the child going to become embroiled in this but what we don't certainly don't expect is the ending that confronts us in the finale, which is so incredibly, the the reversal is so terrifying and so hits us in the face of that sense of innocence revealed in such a terrifying way is the essence of dread, where, where we expect to find innocence, we find a nightmare. What's great about what Nick Rogue did there was, if you read Daphne de Maurier's short story, he basically shot the last paragraph of that short story cinematically he figured out the way that she's laying out what's going on with donald southern's character at that moment he figured out a way to make it cinematic so like you say all the pieces suddenly fall into place in those last few seconds and like you said we've been brought to this place we had no idea that that's where it was going to turn uh neil tell me about enemy from space and what you what you like about that Enemy from Space is the second of the three uh, Quatermass movies, adaptations of the serial. It's in the same vein as uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers and all these other movies about human beings who are being invaded and invested by alien forces. In this case, over the past few years, within the context of the story, there have been a range of these tiny little meteorites. Anyone who finds them they crack open and what's inside infests human beings. And you can find these tiny little burn marks, these V-shaped marks on them. And the parasites take them over and make them into these kind of human slaves. And the premise is they then kind of 
serve th this larger being, um, this kind of group entity, and they proceed to start building these atmosphere plants with the goal ultimately to turn the Earth into a colony for these beings that come from outer space. But the notion of the, these human beings, they have infiltrated our government, infiltrated our community, and they gradually take people over, scary enough. And they have built this enormous plant that looks, he says, this looks just like this proposed lunar base with these giant atmospheric domes. A group of people managed to infiltrate one of these bases. And he looks inside, manages to get close enough to look inside one of these domes. And inside are the parasites. When they're released, they grow together into this thing that looks like a giant blob. That's what it looks like outside of the human hosts. And a bunch of these guys are, they're trapped inside of the atmosphere of plant. And they realize this is like, they can't survive outside the human body. They need methane to breathe because that's what their home planet is like. What we need to do is we need to pump oxygen into this dome to kill this thing. That'll destroy it. And voices come over to say, look, this guy's crazy. There's nothing inside this this dome. You send, send some representatives over. We'll show you. We'll show you anything you want. And Quatermass says, it's like you're crazy. If you go over there, you're going to be infected. You're going to be taken over. But they managed to divide. They send the guys over. And Quatermass is pleading with him. said, listen, what, you know, they're going to get on this speaker. They're going to tell you that everything is fine. But you can't listen. Don't listen to them, whatever you say. And then they hear the, this sound, this hideous sound of screaming coming down the pipes, the pipes that they've been sending oxygen down to the dome. And they say, what the hell is that? What's going on? And then they look, they say, the, the, the pressure has gone way up. There's something is wrong. And this, the pipe is burst. The pipe that's sending oxygen to this dome. And they say, what is it? What's happened? And they look and something is dripping down through the pipe. And they say, what is it? They say, it's blood. They took the guys that they sent and they pushed them into the pipe. They say, those pipes been blocked with human pulp in order to keep the oxygen from coming into the dome. That is one of the most, again, all you see is just these drops of blood coming out of the cracked pipe. But that has resonated as one of the most terrifying moments from any movie that I saw, again, as a little kid. I've seen the movie recently, and it's still incredibly terrifying. And again, the architecture of this web of pipes, the cold black and white architecture, is, is horrifyingly chilling. And the notion of human beings being reduced to mere flesh, being used as material for blocking a pipe. You know, and the pipe's only like this, like this big. So you can imagine like a person shoved into a pipe is hideous. Um, it is available on YouTube if anybody uh, yeah. wants to yeah. watch it after that. Brian, do you want to ask about folk horror? Actually, um, I was going to jump ahead just because of what Neil was just talking about. I thought this would dovetail nicely into a question I had about a fear of contagion. Uh, and you can wrap body horror into this. Movies like uh, The Thing or 28 Days Later or probably The Quartermass Experiment as well. How does that fear of uh, our own bodies being infected or watching another body change or be infected in unnatural ways? How does that... I don't want to use the word appeal, but how does that appeal to our sense of dread? Well, I, I think you, you also have to run back to one of the, the most common, whether it's psychological or physiological, which is obsessive compulsive disorder. You say, well, what exactly is obsessive compulsive disorder? We have built in grooming behaviors, whether it's cleaning our hands, we clean our skin. That's wired into us. And when you turn the dial up too far, that turns into obsessive compulsive behaviors, obsessive hand cleaning or scratching, itching, hair pulling, all that stuff. It's wired in behavior in the same way that dogs will scratch, we will scratch. And so all of that, we react to it in the same way that if you see a spot of dirt on someone's forehead, it's almost impossible. You got to get, clean that thing off. Get rid of that thing. I mean, we're, we're built in a certain way to respond to distortions, infections, invasions, in, in the same way that if someone's eye is cocked to one side, we react to it. Someone's face is distorted. We react to it negatively. We have to work not to respond to it. It may be a bug, but it may be a feature because we we are built to respond to 
a diseased or distorted members of our community. It's a survival trait. And so in some ways, horror movies respond to that. Distorted human beings, a hunchback of Notre Dame, or Igor, or anyone else who are distorted, deformed, limbless creatures, freaks, are employed in horror movies in, in a variety of different ways. And it, it's a very different thing from seeing an arm chopped off versus seeing an arm with three hands that are all operating. Both of them is something happening to your body that you might revolt in towards, but it's a very different reaction though, right? It is, but it, in a sense, it's all variations of the same thing. There's a, a central human norm, and that which varies from the human norm beyond a certain point triggers a, a reaction that says, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And it, it, it's just eyes are too close together, eyes are too far apart, eyes are too big. Oh, there's an extra one. There's one missing. We recoil from it. We recoil from something that is too different, too too far off the norm. And of course, in strictly social terms, you can say, but but why? Why should we? We shouldn't really respond in that way to others who are too different. But we do respond that way. And it comes with the programming in a very real degree. How does that connect then to another movie on your list, uh, The Island of Lost Souls from 1932? I think it's central to that list. The notion of the difference between that which is human and that which is animal, and Moreau who experiments with making animals into human beings, but not really. And the, the sort of the sort of terrifying revelation when our hero and uh, the woman who we we know to be an animal woman, but she looks fundamentally human, escape out into the woods and come across the animal person village. And the realization to what extent Moreau has been experimenting is it's, it's not just tens or dozens. The animal people just come flooding out of the woods and it's just hundreds. Of, and the extent and the depth and the kind of nightmare quality, they're, they're all different. They're all horrible. And it's just like, what has Moreau been doing? He experiments with these animals, gets them to a certain state, and then he just th discards them and moves on to something else. This utterly careless, sadistic god of this army of nightmares. And you sort of see when they do the, you know, are we not men? You know, and you just see row upon row upon row of these hideous nightmare faces. And you just say, my God, what has this guy been doing for years? Just making these monsters. It's a classically creepy movie. Yeah. I do want to ask you about the classic ghost story movie, The Haunting, and what that says about our fears. If you can, maybe tie that into Ghost Watch, because uh, okay. there's a similar sort of thing going on there. They're both intriguing. They both are opening us up to this notion of unseen nightmare forces, I mean, especially the original Haunting, which shows us nothing. All you ever see doorknob turning a face that may or may not be in in the wall this horribly loud banging on the door a moment where someone thinks that her hand is being held but there's no one there it is simply this notion of a house that is born bad but never really fully explained again you have this idea of the world itself that should be well behaved that should be governed by comprehensible natural laws but there's something deeper and darker and incapable of truly being understood never mind being controlled and if you just prod it a little bit too much you're going to open it up to forces that are utterly destructive and utterly malevolent and in both of these cases you have this man of science and his team that are going to find out, we're going to find out for sure whether there really are ghosts, whether there really is a, a supernatural, whether there really is life after death. We're going to nail this down for science. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. These are things that are, that are not meant to be explored, not meant to be examined. Go back. <laughs> I'm reminded of uh, Van Helsing's sign-off on the original Dracula, where he said, just remember, there really are such things in this world. Yeah, yeah. 
And and the same thing is true in some ways on a, on a much more terrifying scale with Ghost Watch, where it's just it's this kind of it's all just fun and Halloween. We're going to explore this. Go- it's the, ha- the most haunted house in Britain, and it's broadcasters whose 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 faces everyone knew at the time, and they were playing themselves going to this haunted house where it's had where you had these poltergeist phenomena and we're all going to we're going to do it live and call in with your own experiences about being haunted and it all just goes so horribly wrong now neil i just watched that for the first time this week heard about it for years i had no idea that those were real broadcasters i thought they were really good actors but to someone in britain watching that those are faces they saw all the time. Yeah, those are real broadcasters. They they had their own shows. They they those were real the, the real deal. Wow, I highly recommend uh, renting it because it it'll test your patience a little tiny bit because it is quite banal for quite a while as they lead you into it. Um, but now this new bit of information that these were all faces that that audience who saw it, quote unquote, live that night, it's as terrifying as I imagine the Orson Welles or the Worlds would have been, because it seems very real. And apparently the way they, they did it is that there was a number you could call in. And if you called in that number, they would tell you, it's like, don't worry, this is all just a show. But so many people were calling in, they couldn't get through. This really is War of the Worlds. So they never they never were able to get to that message that were telling them, don't worry, it's all just a show. So it's, it, apparently it panicked the nation because part of the, the premise was at a certain point, the ghost that was haunting the house got into the show. And so the studio itself became haunted. It was really spectacularly well yeah. done. It is. it is It's great. Let's just sort of wrap up here real quick with, Neil, if you have any advice for a beginning screenwriter about how to best create a really powerful and effective horror screenplay, any little okay. tips? Uh, okay. Well, first of all, uh, I, and I touched on this before, jump scares don't work on the page. You, you, you need the loud bang. You need the hand reaching in from the side. You, you describe that and it doesn't work. So you, you have to rely on creating that sense of dread and while writing screenplays you have to keep things tight the concept the idea in the same way uh comedy screenplays have to be funny scary screenplays have to be scary it have to be scary on the page if it's not scary on the page you're not going to sell the screenplay and that that's the fundamental trick you got to make it scary on the page excellent advice all right let's just quickly uh each one of us tell our listeners a recent favorite horror film that you've seen the last couple of years. I'll start with you, Brian. Just last night, I saw Haunting in Venice. And it worked because I had seen the other Kenneth Branagh, Agatha Christie adaptations. And I was very familiar with, and you know, you already know generally that kind of detective whodunit story. It's going to be very, you know, using logic and rationality. And when they had this episode that was sort of a a one-off, sort of a departure from that usual way that uh, mysteries are solved, it was very effective. I think if I'd seen it without having already watched a bunch of Agatha Christie adaptations, I would have said, "Eh, that's that's an okay Halloween movie. But having seen those other ones, it was an excellent Halloween movie. Excellent. That's on my list. The movie I would recommend, which really surprised me, uh, my wife literally dragged me to it because it was a French film called Final Cut which is a French remake of a Japanese film called One Cut of the Dead. At about the 30-minute mark, I was ready to walk out. I thought, why are we watching this? And then uh, they took us on a ride for the next hour. That It's a really good ride. It's called yeah. Final Cut. And this is not to be confused with the Robin Williams Final Cut from... Not to be confused with that, no. Or if you can go back to the original and watch the Japanese version. What What's great about the French version is they are literally remaking the Japanese version to the point where they've made all the characters have Japanese names, mm-hmm. which the French people struggle with uh, enormously. It's a, a highly effective film. Neil, how about you? Take us home. Okay. Um, it's not a new movie, but it, I, I just saw it very recently. It is a Chilean stop-motion animated film called The Wolf House. It describes the adventures of a young Chilean woman who escapes from a repressive German colony and ends up in this bizarre house in which she blends into the walls. 
She's escaped with two pigs who grow up with her in this house. But again, nothing, no way in which I describe it is going to convey to you how deeply disturbing and chilling this movie is. It really is quite indescribably bizarre and disturbing and just well worth your time to watch. It's not quite like any other movie I've ever seen. Thanks to Neil Marshall Stevens for chatting with me, and special thanks to my occasional co-host, Brian Forrest. You can find links to learn about both of them in this episode's show notes. Did you enjoy the interview? You can find lots more just like it on the Fast Cheap Movie Thoughts blog. Check out the link in the show notes. Plus, more interviews can be found in my books, Fast, Cheap, and Under Control, Lessons Learned from the Greatest Low-Budget Movies of All Time, and its companion book of interviews with screenwriters called Fast, Cheap, and Written That Way. Both books can be found on Amazon or wherever you get your books. And while you're there, check out my mystery series of novels about magician Eli Marks and the scrapes he gets into. The entire series, starting with the ambitious card, can be found on Amazon in paperback, hardcover, ebook, and audiobook formats. And if you haven't done it already, check out the podcast companion for the books, Behind the Page, the Eli Marks Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Well, that's it for episode 117 of the Occasional Film Podcast, which was produced at Grass Lake Studios. Original music composed and performed by Andy Morantz. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you occasionally. <laughs>